I'm Jen Ellis, and I'm the curator of Into Air London. I'm here today with Don Ung, the artist behind this incredible solo show. Welcome, Don. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Don, Into Air is a body of work that spans photography, painting, installation, this time a one-off performance. Could you tell us a little bit more about Into Air, how it started and where it is now? Into Air really is, I would describe it as a love song about mm. time. While most of my work deals with time and memory, what Into Air attempts really hard to do is to inject beauty, temporality, and form into time. As you've mentioned, it, it spans across such a wide breadth of mediums, yeah. including painting, photography, film, even light boxes. And I think in every stage, starting with the photography, what I've always tried to do was to give time a color, shape, and form, mm. and to use the vehicle of ice, the most ephemeral material that I can work with in Singapore, yes. given that we're on the equator and have yeah. 365 days of eternal summer is to put pigments, acrylics, inks, and dyes in these large blocks and to document their collapse. And at every stage and in every moment, what I've always been trying to do is to sort of give a geological mass to time, to give some form of texture, a solidity. They stand really, if you look around at the show, like colored meteorites. Absolutely. And they, they have you know riots of layers of colors that, that in, interlope and play with each other. And when they're first taken out in the studio of the industrial freezers, they actually shot um, in 10 different angles every four hours until they go, wow. they go okay. completely, yeah. So really I'm trying to kind of get that sort of lunar eclipse of time. Mm. And very often what I find is that most beautiful moment, sometimes it starts right at the beginning, sometimes it's right at the end when it's very tiny and I photograph it and I blow it to a size that is as large as life and as arresting so that what I'm really trying to do is freeze frame time back into this form where it's not a number, it's not chronological, but it's a moment, almost a mystical moment or an ethereal moment that you can't get back to again. Now the films are of great fun and great pain <laughs> as well because they, I think with them, what I've always tried to achieve for the viewer is this idea of the forever now. Mm. How do you hold time between someone and a moving image? How do you allow what would take 18 hours for a complete collapse of colors, of pigments and curtains and shades and cascading falls to forever hold you in that moment of disintegration, yeah. to forever see something in what you've been seeing all along? That has like a whole set is built in the studio where we have a pool, a shallow pool, the team is rotating because it's 18 hours nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> um, lights, cameras, and there is so much of this part of the work that, and with this whole entire body of work that you can orchestrate so much, or I can orchestrate so much, I can get different people with different specialties to manage yeah. parts of the process. But there's so much of time and gravity and the pigments just having their own will and way and they go as they want to go. You can't control it. No, yeah. yeah. The ash painting works really try and hold time in its last mm. movement from solid liquid and back to air. So what happens if a complete collapse of a large block of pigment is that I have about 11 to 33 different layers of paint that all have been mixed. They're poured out in large vats and the thick watercolour papers ultimately lay it on top of these vats. Mm. And it's actually through the process of evaporation that a lot of the pigments sort of blossom and bloom on the paper. When I'm dealing with acrylics, they're a lot more viscous. So the way that um, I've lined the vat with acrylic film allows me to control and manoeuvre the way that they flow. And so I usually twist and twine and rope the, the acrylic films, allowing sort of like this tributaries to form in the work. Whereas for you know, when I'm talking about inks and dyes, they have a way of having a very soft topographical blooming mm -hmm. across. And it is this, I guess, interloping of pigments that ultimately in that final sort of gasp or release of the work back to air, the paintings essentially sieve time through that final stage. And it really holds that last sort of very soft firework or yeah. residue. And it tries so hard to catch a ghost. Mm. 
there's that sense of like settling, right? And even in the way that you're describing the entire body of work, mm. um, there's all these geological and geographic associations. I remember the first time I encountered your work, I thought of it as topographical. And, you know, when you're looking at buildings, but also rocks and all these other mm. elements that have existed on this earth for so much longer than us, they are layered and they're complex, but in that same way, bringing it back to ourselves, we are each layered and complex. And it's sort of as if you're peeling each one and giving time to mm. each one as well, which is so incredibly touching. You've shown this body of work beforehand, not this exact one, but you've had exhibitions in Singapore, in Korea, and now we're, we're in London. Perhaps you could expand a little bit more on London and mm. also not just being anywhere in this deeply historical city, but being here in St. Cyprian's Church. It gives me just such great joy to, to finally show the work in you know, a place that is so steeped in time. Mm. In a very ironic way, I've always felt that I come from a, a land of no time. Yeah. If you think about Singapore, which is a really tiny island of the archipelago, in the past, time is actually, it's a construct that actually colonialism brought to islands such as these. Absolutely. If we were to go yeah. all the way back in time, time was told by the rise and fall of tides, by diurnal change, so whether it was morning or night, mm. and so much of um, industrialization, having trade come into Singapore, gave it sort of that language of time, numerical and chronological time. A second thing about Singapore that makes it eternally timeless is that you know we are right off the equator, so we don't have seasons. And yeah. without that, those changes, it's almost as if time doesn't really move and you're eternally young. You're mm -hmm. in this perpetual Shangri-La yeah, yeah, yeah. of a very warm, beautiful city. And the third thing, I, when I think about you know, being here and doing this work is that London has so much, England in itself has so many layers of time. I think England became a unified state in the 1700s and Singapore was born in 1965. Yeah. <laughs> so th there's just so much richness, patina. Mm -hmm. Even the buildings have stories and stories that are built into it that made it a rich and synergistic place mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. hold a show that really tries to speak about time and tries to peel back the layers in its number of mediums that have unfolded and unfurled because of the, the show and the, the, not show, the, the body of work. And that, I think, you know, we, we talked about it almost a year ago. So this Absolutely. is how long we've yeah. been working on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we were okay or keen to move ahead with a white box kind of gallery show, we would have, it would have been simple. It would have been... Absolutely. Solved. <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> you it's know. not the point. It's not the point. It's not the point. We both really wanted to show it in a space that dialogued with the work that had a real authentic relationship with the yeah. work that naturally formed such a glove fit vessel for it. And I think, you know, this church, among many of the venues that, that you had seen and, and shown yeah, me as well, yeah. this one in particular just, just sang. I think that the peeling walls, the, the patina, the richness of the colors, the warms, the ochres, the golds, and sort of that, that pale skin, alabaster skin of, of the, the walls, just, it, it felt right. Mm. And, you know, why a church, Christianity or the Bible also has some of the most fundamental concepts of time in it. Mm. It has the start and the end, like you said. It has the Alpha and Omega. It has Kronos and Kairos. Kronos being chronological time. Kairos being what? Christians would call God's time, time not in minutes and seconds, but in moments and in seasons. And I think that's such that beautiful layering of mm. ideas of time that sort of blossom and flourish with each other. I mean, I remember one of the first conversations we were having, which was around art, space and context. There's obviously what you're creating, the space in which we will exhibit it, you know, because yeah. it's a joint decision. Um, and then also the context. And I guess from my side, 
from the curatorial angle when I was speaking to the church, mm. you know, and sharing your work. And then there was there also enthusiasm with regards to it. And there's that beautiful, authentic conversation, right? But yesterday when we were installing, we were saying how it's a small village when it comes to creating such an exhibition, one that is not straightforward, one that is not simple, but one that has obstacles that it's not about overcoming them, but it's mm -hmm. about coming to face with them and finding a beautiful solution. And one of the idiosyncratic things about this space is that you, know, you couldn't hang things on the walls. Mm -hmm. And so we started brainstorming from an early point um, how we were going to display your work, right? Yes. And then we looked at so many different references, how you could create standing structures, but also ones that you would peer over so that there wasn't just this confrontation. Um, there was a dialogue and mm. a physicality in the experience Absolutely. of also your work. Yes, um, the ritual of looking at something. Mm. I think the way you behold an object or a piece of art changes your relationship immediately to it. Oftentimes when you peer down at something, the fact that your head bows towards it and the fact that it's at your feet, yeah. it's, it's mutually humbling in, in the act. When you look at something that is much taller than you, there is a reverence. Your eyes kind of trail and, and scatter upwards. And I think all these points, like you said, you know, were, were so absolutely considered down to the structures of now these like monumental structural <laughs> yeah. vessels that are caging the works or you know holding them what i was so inspired by the first time mm -hmm. when we came to this church in march was the pews and that very the simple, language, yeah. simple modernist language of you know the clean lines um, quite raw finishes of wood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that ultimately led to, you know, the design of all these structures that follow, mm -hmm. actually, if you look at it carefully, the, the shape and form of pupits, of um, altars, of also, you know, benches, very simple structural forms. Yeah, and there's once again that harmony, right? Yeah. And harmony is such a, it's a running note, not to come back to you know, the singing element too much, but there is that running note throughout. Um, and perhaps actually on that, there's gonna be a one-off performance as mm -hmm. part of this exhibition. And performance is something that in your body of work, you're exploring more. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. So. I'm very excited about this part because I get to work with an amazing Welsh composer, Alex Mills. And, you know, of course, because of COVID and traveling was being so hot, we did this entirely through the ether, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> through Zoom. Yeah. Um, and what we, the work is, is very much, his work is very much inspired by this body of work and particularly the film, the timeless mm -hmm. film that was created, um, where in which you see the complete sort of destruction of, of a block of pigment. And the way that I talked about the work coming in layers and yeah. cycles um, really resonated with the way he thought about breath work and singing. Mm -hmm. And because of that, in our collaboration, what we began to do was to layer both of that and have them sort of mirror each other or echo each other. So right now, um, the performance involves five different vocalists. And I think the church lends that sort of like really beautiful oral sound. Yeah, the acoustics. The acoustics. Yeah. And he will have them in different parts of the church and they will sing according to cycles of their breath. So the sound should build and swell in a very organic way and then also collapse in and of itself. And I think it's that constant breathing and expansion and contraction that also has the same materiality that you find in the film, where pigments are, you know, are, are melting and evaporating, pulling and drawing. And I think that's one of the most, the joy and the, can and the candor to, be yeah. able to being able to work in that manner with someone. Yeah, and I think what's so beautiful is in that collaboration, there is a cyclicality. Mm -hmm. And even though there is that relationship with your time-lapse video and that your film work, it overall connects to the cyclical aspect 
of into air, mm. right? Where each different work is connected to the other. And I think that's such a beautiful metaphor for the rest of the world, right? Everything is interconnected. You know, there's this domino effect and it just sort of reminds you when you step in here, when you step into this quiet church mm. off a busy area in central London and you just have this moment of pause, of contemplation regarding the cyclicality of our own presence here, but then how it's sort of frozen in time as well. Yes. And I think, you know, with sort of that material of working with ice and, and what you're saying about cyclicality, if you think about the truth that, you know, from the moment you are born, you mm. begin to die, then I yep. do feel that ice yields to that law of nature in the most sort of condensed, scintillating manner. And there is so much beauty and death, I think, that interlopes with this idea of cyclicality. And it's, it's something like you say, it, it's 100% intimate and yet 100% universal yeah I think that's yeah and I think that's what I would really love for people to come and take away from the work and to see that that movement of time and that change mm. you've worked on so many different projects with a, a host of amazing artists what made you choose to work on into air mm. in 2022 so for me, what motivates me as a curator is that art is one of the most empathetic, but also critical mediums by which you can communicate about topics. And then when you look at the topics that you can be conversing about at the very core of my own personal self is a care for well-being, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. but also a care for the life that you have here in the now. And so when I first came across your work, I was really blown away by that infinite attention to care for the here and the now, but also your ability to articulate it and to put into color and form things that I was not able to express, but that I connected to. And then I thought just simply from a gut perspective, and like if I connect to this, I know others will too, and I want to share this story. Others need to hear this. And so that was my immediate connection with it. But then you cannot disassociate the art from the person, in my belief, especially when you are curating an exhibition, because you become so close to that person. Yes. <laughs> it's WhatsApp, it's calls, it's Zooms, it's... Um, in the same way that mm. when you create an artwork, it's an extension of your soul. When you curate a show, at least in my case, it's an extension of my soul. So you've got these two souls that are intertwining. And when we started speaking, I instantly, and once again, instinctively, I was like, ah, oh, there's a connection here and there's a mm. story that can be told together. And then layer upon layer, you keep on adding these different players or these different storytellers. And yes. I'm like, this is... This is not just a little short story. This is a manuscript. <laughs> and so we need to find the right place and time that is worthy of this manuscript. You know? So we spoke a lot right, about yeah. where this is going to take place, when is it going to take place. And you know, for me, I want to create meaningful moments and meaningful projects happen. And to me, this is meaningful. And you mentioned 2022, you know, I, like you, you know, like probably everyone, you know, we were limited in terms of travel where we could see, feel, experience, but never have I felt more connected to my own presence in this planet and mm. my great fortune for being here and with my health and with my own breath. And so having a work that relates to that. Yeah is very meaningful in this present moment. Um, and I think it's a show that people will remember as one of the one first times we've got guests coming, you know, from Singapore, from different parts of the world coming here to feel it. And we're all brought together after a time of pause, after a time of actually kind of holding your breath as if you were underwater. Yes. So, yeah, yeah that's why. So true. 